Hi, so, hello brothers and sisters. Um, this video is going to be a study on the person and natures of Christ. Okay, I've been working on this for a while, quite a few weeks now, and I was going to, I want to talk about uh, how De Jesus Christ is God, the deity of Jesus Christ. And um, so I was going to teach on that, and then I thought I'd give like a brief overview of the persons and natures of Christ, because that's involved and then I thought that's not enough and I need to separate these studies and I need to do a more fuller study on the person and natures of, of Christ and, um, and I was going to do that early but I've added more and more to it but I think that I'm finally at a point where I can do this study and uh, I've learned a lot um, so I guess I'll pray first dear God thank you so much for this wonderful day and for this blessing for this study God thanks for your grace to help me get through this study and now I ask that you help me to present this study in a video so people can easily understand these things. Uh, I pray that you'll bless those who hear this. And um, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, the person and natures of Christ. Okay. Uh, when I've looked at a lot of studies concerning the person and natures of Christ, usually they mention the the Chalcedonian Creed. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that or not, but I guess it was written in 1425 AD, uh, or 4, 425 AD, sorry, 400 years after the death of Christ. Um, so, the Chalcedonian Creed sums up a lot about the persons and natures of Christ. They wrote it to combat a lot of the heresies and stuff that was going on. So this is kind of like their doctrinal statement that people got together and they made this. They said, this is what the Bible teaches, you know, this is the God that we worship, and as far as I can see, most of this is accurate, so I don't put a lot of stock in the creeds and stuff, uh, you know, church history for arguments and whatnot, but I think that it's, uh, this is notable when we're thinking of the person and natures of Christ. So I'm going to read the Chalcedonian Creed that was written in 425 AD. Okay. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, uh, you know, the Mother of God, maybe that's something that uh, I would disagree with, and I actually never even noticed that until now, but we'll continue. According to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning Him, and the Lord Jesus Christ Himself taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. Now, one thing that this creed doesn't do is it doesn't state that Jesus' human nature has no personal subsistence of its own. So, like I said, this creed's not scripture or anything that. It's just notable, notable. It's something good to look at. Um, it, it, it gets a lot of facts about Jesus correct, how he's fully God, he's fully man, okay? One person. And I want to break this down more and explain these things in detail and give arguments to prove these things. So, let's see here. Defining person and nature. So let's talk about what is a person, you know, what is nature? How do we define these things? How do we see these things, okay? A person possesses a nature, okay? Not the other way around. It's not that a nature possesses a person, a person possesses a nature. And a person cannot exist without a nature, okay? So I'm just going to go through and I'm going to give these distinctions between person and nature so we can try to better understand these two. So a person possesses a nature, not the other way around. Okay, Not a nature possesses a person. That's false. A person cannot exist without a nature. Okay, Now my nature suggests that there is a person. 
I who possesses a nature. Okay? Nature answers the question what we are, and person answers the question who we are. Okay? So I'll write that down. Let's see here. Let's see where I'm at on the board. Nature is who, or nature is what, sorry. Nature is what, person is who. Okay, that's an easy way to, to see that. Okay. Nature answers the question what we are, and person answers the question who we are. Now, every being has a nature. Of every being we may properly ask what is it, but not every being is a person. Only rational beings are persons. Okay. We could not properly ask of a rock or a carrot or a fish, who is it? Okay. Um, so they are not persons. Um, so a person, uh, only rational beings are persons. Okay. Only rational beings, hope that's all on there. Yeah, are persons, okay? Now, next, by our nature, we do what we do. By our nature, we do what we do. Every being acts according to what it is, okay? There are many things we can do. We can laugh and cry and walk and talk and sleep and think and love. All these things and more we can do because as human beings we have a nature which makes them possible. A snake could do only one of them, and that is sleep. A stone could do none of them. Nature then is to be seen not only as what we are, but the source of what we can do. Okay. So nature... Uh, let's get this. Nature is the is nature is what we are and the source this is kind of sloppy but hopefully you can read it the source of what we can do okay Um, nature is the source of our operations, okay, but the person does them. My nature decides what kind of operations are possible for me. It is not my nature that does them, it's I that do them. I, the person. Person and nature may be considered sources of action, but in different sense, in a different sense. The person is that which does the actions. The nature is that by virtue of which the actions are done, or better, that from which the actions are drawn. It is our nature to do certain things, but that we do them. We operate in or according to our nature. Okay? The Bible teaches that God is three persons and that Jesus is one person with two natures. Just because in man we find a one person, one nature relationship, and just because it is beyond our complete understanding does not negate the truth of the Trinity or the dual natures in Christ. We are finite beings, okay, and Christ and God is infinite. We can only begin to catch a glimpse of both the nature that we ourselves have and the person that we ourselves are. We are more in darkness on this subject than in light. Okay, so for now, that's the most that I'm going to say about this. We understand that when it concerns nature, we're talking about what person is who. Only rational beings are persons. Nature is what we are and the source of what we can do. Okay, I need to get out my eraser. Make some more room for the next part. So now that we can understand the difference and the distinctions between person and nature, we can, we can continue the study and go into the person of Christ and see that he is one person, he is one divine person, and that 
he has two natures, okay, a divine nature and a human nature. Um, so first we'll talk about how Christ is one person, okay. Christ is one person. Now, we're going to set up some arguments to prove this from Scripture. Okay. For one, nothing is said in Scripture of Jesus having more than one person. Okay, nothing says that Jesus is two persons uh, in the Bible. In Scripture, also, we see the Trinity. Okay, we see how God is three persons and one divine being. Now, each of the persons are distinguished well from one another, and they are introduced as speaking to one another. It follows that if there were two persons in Jesus Christ, we would see them speaking to each other using the same language seen used between the Father and the Son, such as thee or thou. We find nothing of the sort in Scripture, and therefore, the reason must be that the human personality is not present in the mediator. Okay. So there's one person. There's, so for one, uh, nothing is said of two persons. Okay. Now that's not always the best argument for things, just to say that it's not mentioned in Scripture. But let's look at these other points. Okay. Now next, Christ is called one mediator. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we see that there is one God in relation to man. Okay, there is only one God. There are no other gods. Only one God. And it follows that there is only one mediator. Who is the mediator? The man, Christ Jesus, the person. Okay, there is one mediator. Therefore, it is suggested that there must be one person in Christ Jesus. Okay? So, the second argument that Christ is one person is because he is one mediator. Okay? There's only one mediator, Jesus Christ, the person. There's only one person. Now, number three is that Jesus always speaks of himself as one and the same person. Okay? No matter if what is said about him refers to his divine or his human existence, it is the same identical subject that speaks in both relationships when it is said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, and when stated before Abraham, I was, John chapter 8, verse 58. We can hereby conclude oneness of persons and duality of natures. Okay. So Jesus speaks of himself as one and the same person. So Jesus uh, speaks let's see speaks of himself as one and the same person. So, you know, whether he's speaking uh, in relation to his human nature or whether he's speaking in relation to his divine nature, he's speaking of himself, okay? The one person that Jesus Christ is. Now, the Nestorian heresy taught that there were two separate persons in Christ. Okay, so I'm going to go over some of these heresies in the future. I want to go over them in more detail. Uh, some of them might not be so popular today. And I want to say another important thing to, of learning this, that learning that Jesus Christ is God, that he has two natures, he's one person and stuff, we can refute false teachings. And, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they deny that Jesus is God. And uh, Mormons teach that Jesus is a God, and they teach, you know, that there's multiple gods. So when we study this and we learn who Jesus really is, who God really is, and, and all the workings of this, then we can see how they're wrong. Okay. And um, hopefully maybe we can better help them then, too. But it's going to help us anyway. So there's a lot involved in this of, of why it's important to know this stuff. 
So the Nestorian heresy taught that there were two separate persons in Christ. Okay, I gave you three arguments to show you that Jesus is one person. Okay. Um, now, let's see that the person in Christ is divine. Okay. We'll say he's one divine person. Okay. We don't refer to him as a human person. Christ is a divine person. Okay. Now, for one, passages on the incarnation start from eternity past in the person of the Son of God. Okay. And I'm going to read through some of these passages. The first one is John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So in the beginning the Word was with God, the Word was God. This was before the Incarnation, okay, before Jesus took on flesh. He was God. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So this is John, again, basically saying the same thing, uh, that Jesus was with the Father um, in eternity past, okay, before the Incarnation. We always start out the story with Jesus in the beginning was with the Father. You know, he is God. He's equal with the Father. Uh, so one more, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I want to go into a little bit more detail in this passage. When it says that Christ being in the form of God, it means that he possessed the essential divine attributes. Only God can be in the form of God. When Christ humbled himself, he humbled himself of the prerogatives and appearances of deity, not the essence. Christ never ceased being God. The assumption of a new nature, Christ's human nature, does not mean the cessation of Christ's divine nature. If Christ ceased being divine, one of the members of the Godhead would have ceased to exist. The assumption of a new nature also does not mean that the nature of Jesus was in any way changed. Okay. So, we see passages on the Incarnation start from eternity past in the person of the Son of God. So, he's a divine person because uh, Incarnation passages start in the person of the Son of God. Okay. So Jesus Christ is a divine person. Okay, he never ceased being a divine person. Now We'll have another argument here. Passages speaking of the union of the divine person with the human nature always have the divine person active and not passive. For example, he became flesh, John chapter 1, verse 14. He took on the seed of Abraham. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. He humbled himself, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. He became poor, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. So, passages speaking of the union of the divine person with the human nature always have the divine person active, not passive. Okay. So... Okay. When uh, speaking of the union of the natures the divine nature is always active. And I'll get out of the way a little bit so you can see it better. Now one more argument for this to prove that Christ is one divine person. The humanity of Jesus is never spoken of in personal terms, but in terms of nature. It's not a man that Jesus assumed, but flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Okay. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Flesh in this context means the fullness of human nature, body and soul, but without personality needed. Okay, it doesn't say God sending His own Son in the likeness of, you know, to become a man, to assume a man, but to assume flesh. Okay, the fullness of human nature. You know, the Word became flesh, not the Word became a new person. Okay. Uh, so, there is one divine person, and the humanity of Jesus is spoken of in personal terms. So, uh, it's not a man that Jesus assumed, but flesh. Okay. Not a man that Jesus assumed, but flesh. And I don't know if it can be read well on the video or not, but I'll zoom in a bit as close as I can there. And you can pause it or whatever on the video. These notes are all on the website as well, so. But I'm going to have to make more space. Um, Now, what did I do with the eraser again? Put it back in here. Okay. So we see that Christ is one person, one divine person. Now we're going to continue on to the two natures aspect, the dual natures of Christ. Now, Uh, two distinct natures. Two distinct natures. The one divine person of Jesus Christ consists of two distinct natures. One human and one divine. The properties or attributes of both natures may be properly predicated of the one person. In other words, the one person of Jesus Christ retains all of the attributes of both natures. So through his divine nature, he is omniscient, while simultaneously through his human nature, he may lack knowledge. The union of the two natures is not an indwelling nor a mere contact or occupancy of space, but a personal union. This is similar 
to the union of body and soul in human beings. This union of the two natures in Christ is referred to as the hypostatic union. Okay. The hypostatic union. The two natures exist together in perfect union, so that the human is never without the divine, and the divine without, or the divine without the human. But the natures do not mix or mingle. Okay, so I'll note that they're not mixed. Okay, not mixed or mingled. The two natures, um, divine and human, are distinct, but inseparably united in the one person. Okay. The two natures retain their own attributes or qualities and are thus not mixed together. So they are inseparably united in the one person. Inseparably. Inseparably united in the one person. Um, now, Eutychian, the Eutychian heresy, I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced, the Eutychian heresy blended the two natures of Christ together to form one hybrid nature, also called monophysitism. Monophysitism, meaning one nature. Okay, so there are people who taught I said before there are people who taught that there were two persons in Christ, one divine person, one human person. There's also uh, people who taught that that instead that there were two natures, but they were or that there was one nature and they were mixed together. Okay. So he has uh, the divine nature. Divine nature. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about this because that's another study that I'm going to be working on in parts. There's a lot to it. And I'll go more into detail into the union of the two natures as well in the future. Go into detail and, and a, a lot more in, in all of this stuff. But anyways, the divine nature. Uh, I have John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Through his divine nature, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who shares the one divine essence fully and equally with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, so I'm going to put down Son of God. Son of God. And... Um, Shares divine essence fully and equally with the Father. and Holy Spirit fully Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man he's the son of God now the Arian heresy viewed Jesus as merely a godlike creature so the Arians uh, rejected that Jesus was God um, the deity of Christ can be seen through his various names and titles, Jesus, Lord, Son of God, etc. It can also be seen through his pre-existence, his sinlessness, his divine attributes, and many more evidences can be found in Scripture. And I plan to go over those in extensive detail in the future, but not now. This is just a general overview of 
Jesus and um, natures. Let's see here. Okay. I'm trying to find out where I was here. Now we'll talk about the human nature. Go into this a little bit more. The human nature of Jesus Christ. I have John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Through His human nature, Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, fully human, possessing all the essential attributes of a true human being. Okay? So, Son of Man... that expresses his human nature and uh, fully man possesses all essential um, attributes <clears throat> he possesses all the essential attributes of a true human being. Now, Docetism, I don't know if that's how it's pronounced either, but docetism denied the true humanity of Christ. So there are those who deny that Jesus Christ was truly human. Um, now this has to be mentioned, his human nature has no personal subsistence of its own. Its personal existence is in the person of the Son of God. The person of the Son of God serves as the person for the human nature as well as the divine. He lends personality to both. Okay, we saw before that Jesus is one divine person. Okay, not one human person, but he does have a human nature. Okay, um, and personality is lended to the human nature through the uh, divine nature, the divine person. Okay, the divine person. Um, And we see this because the divine person, who cannot change, was already in existence. Therefore, his human nature must be impersonal, not of itself personally, or else there were two subjects in existence. There would be two mediators. Okay. So the divine person, um, and also because all human persons have a sinful nature, yet Christ was sinless, and he had to be for our salvation. The human nature of Christ can be seen from his title Christ and Son of Man through his infirmities and weaknesses and much more. So I just want to say that the human nature has no personal subsistence of its own. I don't even know if you can see this very well, but... No personal subsistence in the human nature of its own. So, I'll go into much, much more detail about the divine nature and the human nature of Christ, but those are some of the most more important points. And I'll zoom in a little bit for people who watch this on YouTube. And you can pause it, take notes, whatever. The notes are on the website. Okay. Um, now I want to make one more point. This is kind of outside the scope of the study a little bit, but I think it's worth mentioning as well. And that is that because of the two natures, because of the dual natures in Christ, Jesus has two wills. Okay.
to Wells. This is called monothelitism. Monothelitism. As a result of the two natures, Jesus has two wills. Okay, it's evident from Scripture. John chapter 6, verse 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, his human will that subjects to the Father, but the will of him that sent me, the divine will equal with the Father. Okay, Matthew chapter 26, verse 42, He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Jesus' human will pleading with the divine will of the Father that Jesus' divine will is equal to. In John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, the human will submissive to the Father, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. Okay, that expresses his divine will as well. And so, as a summary of all this, Jesus Christ is one person with two distinct natures, a divine nature and a human nature. Even though Jesus has two natures, he is one in his person. His person is divine. His human nature has no personal subsistence of its own. Its personal existence is in the person of the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the same person before and after the Incarnation. Before the Incarnation, Jesus had one nature that was divine. After the Incarnation, Jesus added to himself a human nature which subsists with the divine nature he had and still has. Jesus had a divine consciousness and a human consciousness which results in two wills but remains one in person. So I know that's a lot to take in. Probably didn't present it as good as I could have, but I hope that you got something from that. And, uh, you know, there's lots of questions that I want to answer. I want to answer for myself, and, and when I feel that I get the answers, I want to share them. You know, some of the questions, you know, how could Christ be fully God and fully man? How could Christ the Father and the Holy Spirit all be God, and yet there be only one God? So that involves the Trinity, too. Um, how could God, who is spirit, take on the form of man, who is flesh? How could Christ be born of a sinful woman and not have a sin nature? How could Christ, being God, die on the cross without God dying? How could Christ lay aside the independent exercise of divine attributes such as omnipresence, omniscience, and um, tr or transcendence? How does one possess those qualities and yet not exercise them? Is Jesus, if Jesus is God, then did Jesus pray to himself? When Jesus is speaking to God in the Gospels, is he talking about himself since he himself is God? So those are questions that I look to answer and much more. Um, now, there was one verse that I, I didn't, I was going to go over a little bit more, and I kind of skipped it. It seems kind of out of place now, but I guess I'll just add this in for a bonus study here. I mentioned earlier 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where it says, There is one God, one mediator. Uh, between man and God, or between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And I said that when, he, when Paul says that there is one God, he's speaking in relation to man, okay? That there is only one God, there are no other gods. And the only way to get to this one God is through the one mediator, Christ Jesus. Um, and. That's also like what Jesus said, you know, I am the way, I am the truth, the life. No man can get to the Father except by me. Um, but I wanted to mention that people who deny the Trinity might come at you with this verse. And I just want to mention some things that this verse does not say, okay? It says there is one God, and uh, but what it doesn't say is that... Um, God is one person, okay? It doesn't say that God is one person, though they might want you to believe that that's what it says. It also doesn't say that God is not three persons, okay? Saying that God is one does not deny the Trinity. And uh, it's speaking of his relation to man, there's only one God. It also does not say that Jesus is not God, okay? So they might say, well, see, it says there's one God, and then it says there's one mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. So they say, 
see Christ Jesus as a man. He's not God because, you know, it talks about them, you know, differently. Um, but it doesn't deny that Jesus is God. It doesn't say anywhere there that Jesus isn't God, okay? Um, Paul is expressing the, the human nature of Jesus Christ when he said the man Christ Jesus, okay? Um, Jesus needed to be divine and human for the atonement. And so, but just remember that when it says there is one God, it doesn't say that God is one person. It doesn't say that God is not three persons. It doesn't say that Jesus isn't God. So I think that's really helpful. Somebody might stump you on that or something and get you to, to start questioning the Trinity. But uh, that doesn't dismantle the Trinity at all. So, hope you learned stuff from the study. And I guess I'll pray. Dear God, thanks for helping me to get through the study and finally get another video out there. Help me to continue making more studies and videos. But I pray that this will just bless the people who watched it, that they'll learn. I learned. Help us in our day-to-day -day lives, God. We all have troubles and, and things that we, we need you. We need you every day, and we need your forgiveness, God. We ask for your forgiveness. Uh, who knows how many times you know we sin in words, thought, and deed daily. Um, we know we need your forgiveness. We need your grace, your mercy, your love, God. We want it. We ask for it. And uh, just pray that you bless those who hear this again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully I'll get something out again soon. God bless.